Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited. I have with me today Angela Page and Mia Altieri, the authors of There's a Dead Girl in My Yard. Angela is a writer, film producer, and graduate of the London School of Economics and also NYU. Mia is an actress, writer, improviser, and voiceover talent. Angela and Mia, welcome. Thanks, Becky, for having us. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, your title grabbed me from the first time I heard it. So I would love to hear a little bit more. Tell us about the inception of this story. I'll have Mia do that, but it started in a Starbucks. All right. All started at Starbucks. Started in a Starbucks somewhere between Phoenix and Sholo. To just jump right to it, Angela and myself and two other gals were off to a film festival for one of a film that Angela actually wrote and produced. And we were very early in the morning at the Starbucks using the restroom, getting coffee, and I received a text. And I answered back, and then I received another text that upset me beyond belief. And Angela could see my reaction, because I probably swore out loud, And she said, what's wrong? And I said, there's a dead girl in my yard and all these people want to come in and see the tree. And I just kept going. And she like, just looked at me like, like, what did you just say? I think I I opened my arms (laughs) too wide. That's a book. It's a movie. It's a show. It's a something. I don't know. Please tell. Yeah. And then right. <laughs> for the rest of the weekend, I just shared the, the story with her of wow. what was going on None. with the dead girl in now, my yard. Yeah. Had you authored any books or writing prior to that? No. This is my first published piece. And Angela's, <laughs> she's, she's uh, quite savvy at the whole thing. Yeah, I've been traditionally published uh, with a small press, and I've been self-published of a book that was, what Mia mentioned, the, the, the film Sylvia. It's based on Suddenly Single Sylvia, which is a dating guide for boomers and a novella. And so this, so ours is, our, this is my third book. There is. Say. But the dead girl was real. So we, she could elaborate a little more of who was the dead girl and how she became the mourner manager of the dead girl in her yard under an olive tree. Do tell. <laughs> as much as you want without any spoilers. Well, we did take the root, no pun intended, of the story and then just had so much fun making it up and giving it a a false identity and a couple other false identities and characters from all over the world coming together who end up knowing each other from years and years before, but it all ties in. But yeah, there I moved into this place, a little place here in Topanga, And um, I lived there for a bit and someone met a friend and then the friend called me and asked if I would be willing to plant a tree in memory of one of his best friend's girlfriends or, you know, friends that had just passed away early from a terrible cancer. And of course I was like, of course, but I was renting, it wasn't my own property. So I got permission to plant the tree But the day there was a big celebration happening and her friends came and it was beautiful shamans and music and prayers and champagne. But before that, as they were setting up, I was peeping out the window, like spying on the whole thing. And on my deck, out comes this turquoise urn. And no one told me about that. And I certainly knew it wasn't some flower pot that they were going to put the tree in because it was a bigger tree. So I even have photos of them putting the urn in and putting the tree and all the things around the tree, the crystals. And so, I mean, they've lasted, it's been like three years. I sense don't live there any longer, but that's how it started to happen. The whole mourner management. It's like, well, Mia, you know, people are going to want to come and see the tree and visit. I mean, this woman, 
talk about friends and followers all over the world. And I mean, I hope that I have some, just one or two people who love me that much when I'm no longer here, let alone like the fifties and sixties and seventies of people who are on the WhatsApp list, but people would stop by and want to take a picture of the tree or want me to take pictures and send it to the WhatsApp group. And that was the, the text that upset me because the guy, Eric, who was in the original friend of the friend or friend of the gal, I just kept asking him like, Hey, I just need like 24 hours or 48 hours before. Cause I was traveling a lot up North at the time. And so here I am in Arizona and he's out in front of the gate. And I said, Oh, I'll be back on Tuesday. And then he wanted the main gate code for the main house. So he could get in on the property whenever he wanted. And I kind of just didn't understand how someone could be so bold. And I let Starbucks know that. <laughs> or, or the people in Starbucks know that. We kind of use the, we had to have her have a following. So we use the, the she was a health <laughs> yeah. of some sort and had a YouTube following. So we actually lifted that into the book. And then, of course, M- Mia and, you know, the, it's in the first person, most of the, the chapters uh-huh. and, and Poppy, who's the main character. So we, we kind of like loosely based it on Mia's successes <laughs> and uh, challenges of being a, uh, an actress in Hollywood. And we use that as an inspiration and some of her, and, but a lot oh, of the Lord. antics we elevated, but a lot of the basis of it. <laughs> and on top of that, later that evening, after she said there's a dead girl in my yard, she's wearing yeah. this beautiful gown <laughs> and it turned out it belonged to the dead girl. So she actually inherited the dead girl's clothes and every time she wore the clothes she got at the audition, she got the part. So we actually, we enveloped that into the book as well. Yeah. So. It started, it was so sweet. Like they just wanted me to have something of her. So this other friend of hers and Eric came <laughs> over and gave cool. me a few things. And then the gal called and said, you know, why don't you come over? We're getting rid of all of her stuff and just take things. And so I did. And she was like my, I mean, she lost a lot of weight when she was sick, but there was a lot that was my size and she's was very designer in the, I mean, they're all gorgeous clothing. And so it was odd, like putting on her Manolos to go to an audition or like the scarf or a blouse or a skirt or a dress. Mm. But it was that, that was something special. So I brought a magic realism to the scene there, yeah. which actually came from yeah. real life. Yeah. Well, you know, life is really magical realism. I mean, realism is magical. Yes. <laughs> and also, we rewrote in the car. She had a beautiful vintage Jag, and they had parked it at the, the L.A. airport. And so the guy asked, like, hey, why don't, would you mind? We'll pay you instead of paying at the airport. Because I had, it like, a double-door garage, a driveway until they figured out what they were going to do with it. So like, yeah, okay, no big deal. So that we, so the Jag is in there, it's a different color, but that's, that's part of the uh, part of it too. And, you know, some of the restaurants, the names are changed and everything, but the atmosphere is, is still the same, but we just had so much fun. And Angela just kept coming up with these, you know, the money laundering ideas and the, you know, people being not who they really were. I mean, more than just one, but yeah, it was really fun to, to write. So it's like, yeah, we, we, we started out very silly. And then when the pandemic yeah. hit, we kind of gave it, gave it a more and more gravitas. Mm-hmm. We felt not so silly anymore as a lot of people. <laughs> right. Right. So her legacy really has continued on in a whole other way that, that she probably never would have suspected. <laughs> Yes. That's right. That's right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And we really wanted to pay homage to that side of it and, you know, t- obviously tweak it. So it's not, I don't know, what do you want to say? Like spot on. Right. But yeah, I mean, that was one thing I felt very responsible of. And, you know, there is some lightness in it and the character is still a little bit different, but I did want that to be part of it because that was so much a part of her. And it was such a great thing she did for to suffer, I mean, for anybody suffering of this particular cancer. Yeah. And I still think that the the website is still going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about the, the writing. How did you approach it as co-authors? I always find that that's a really interesting area of exploration because co-authoring anything is, uh, 
there's a lot of variety in how people approach that. And I would love to hear how you did that. Well, I actually kicked it off at some kind of a writing sprint in LA, you know, where they put you in a room and you're there for four hours. And I could hear, see Mia's voice and the way she told the story about the dead girl resonated with me so much that I just embodied her voice many times. And then I would send her the chapters to validate, would you really, would Poppy Mm -hmm. say this or, you know, with your voice? So I had her voice telling me the story and her demeanor and her surprise and and angst and all this about everything in my Mm -hmm. head. And so, and then of course, we didn't think about putting the, give the deck girl a voice until COVID happened. And we said, we're going to need to layer this a little more. And that's when we we expanded the dead girl character at that point. But the, the co-writing, I think, happened pretty naturally. I mean, if I hit a, a block, I would come with an idea and maybe Mia would expand on it and bring it back to me. And we trade the chapters mm-hmm. back and forth um, and, and then agreed on the ending. But I had a hard time because I'd never written murder mystery or, co- you know, or thriller. I had to train myself to do um, how to how to close all the loopholes, right. right, and circle back and and then have a double and triple twist at the end. That was really hard, mm-hmm. actually. And me and Nels, I was I was sweating over that at the end. The last couple of chapters. <laughs> <laughs> and then bless her heart, she couldn't get the characters out of her head for like months. Like they were still talking to her. <laughs> oh, you know, I was going to ask you about that. Did did you find yourself like having dreams? Were they haunting you? Were the your characters? Oh, yeah. Of the morning, I would text uh, me and I said, "Guess what? I think that girl need. I, no, I think Poppy needs a boyfriend. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. and, and he's this and that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I mean, just some of the things is even some of the stuff that's not even in the book. There was this whole thing about a quarter, and there was just a lot of things that would come out of an idea. But then Angela said, like, wow, if we we need to really pull this back into something, which made it even that much more fun to try to figure out how to do it. But I mean, I have to just thank God for Angela because she was so organized and it was something that I had never done before. Like, an outline? What? You know, I mean, <laughs> so she really, really helped me a lot. And I just appreciate it so much because it was like me, just, just do this right about the family. Okay, great. <laughs> and I just, and then she would like pull it all back together to make more sense. So I'm super glad about that. I would actually bring the, chap- the chapters to my writer's mm-hmm. group. So it wasn't mm-hmm. just us. I'd say that Three quarters of the book went before at least oh, well, yeah. two of my writers' yeah. groups. And, and that was also great because they would give her great notes and she would send them to me. And, you know, the ones we liked, we would keep. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of help on the outline. I mean, that was really critical with the outline. We stopped the first couple of chapters and then make sure the outline was right. up straight, right. which changed the course of the course. Yeah. But that was really critical. Also, to make it a three act structure like a film, because we think this is screen worthy. Totally. So we we're very. Adam, and to be able to make this into what maybe a limited series so that they'll be contained six or eight episodes or but it's too big for a film so we we believe it's a six to eight episode yeah. yes limited series that's great actually dears about how you were thinking about that as you were doing that writing as you were structuring creating the structure for the book itself because i know there are a lot of writers who write their novel and then they this could be a film but they're not thinking about it in advance, the way you have, you come at it from a different background. So you have that that filmmaking background. Uh, can you tell us anything more about any other ways? A lot of writers don't put in act three. That's the problem that peters off into the sunset. Mm-hmm. But you, got, you also have to have the turning point. So I actually do workshops on this with writers about how to take the screenplay, the, the screenplay structure, a uh, yeah. classic screenplay structure, and and, uh, and write your novel with it. So you've got Act One with turning points, Act Three, sorry, and Act Two, where you know all is lost moment, and then there's some resolution, and the the hero doesn't get what they want, and then eventually they succeed at the end, and they're changed. So that hero's journey kind of thing. That's what drove us. Of course, we had two hero, we had two heroines, yeah. you know, and we also had the dead girl became the antagonist yes. because she was getting Poppy into the main character into a lot of trouble. Yeah you know, endangering her. So we had some very, and obviously typical character structure as well, but that's really critical. It's not enough for the place, the characters, the dialogue. You need that, stru- you need that act three, act mm-hmm. one, two, three. That's great that you do that, that you work with authors in that way. So what would you say 
What was the biggest challenge for you with, let's just start off with the writing process. What would you say was the biggest challenge? I think it was the structure. It was the outline. That was, mm-hmm. we spent a long time on And I had to have professional help on that and beside the writings group. So I, I really worked, we worked hard on that. I think it was, it was tying all these together because as Mia said, when we decided to put an element in, we'd have to go back to all these chapters and introduce that element or a character or some foreshadowing. And we said, this is what would wake us right. up in the middle of the night. Oh my God, we have to change, you know, chapter 10. It's got this, we got to have this guy saying this or this woman saying that. And that was, right. I had to make notes and say, oh my God. And then I remind each other, you know, we need to have that. Oh, we're going to put a pistol in here. Oh my God, it better show up somewhere else. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what I think also t- when we decided that the dead girl was going to have her own voice in it, then mm-hmm. aligning like the timeline of the two of them, like their timeline to match up because they, those two meet, which make the whole book like this other like explosion. And so we had to make sure and just give each like not the amount of time, but so we could really develop Iris's side of her life or Dahlia's side of her life at the same time. And then so a lot of chapters were kind of moved around and then had to go back and make sense of it flowing kind of that way. Right. That continuity, it's like having somebody on continuity with both of you paying attention to it that I'm sure that helped. Yeah, yeah. I mean, having done films, we know that about the continuity is the key, right? When you're Right, right. So we had yeah. a lot of that background a lot. Yeah. And then flipping that around, what would you say was the best part of writing together? Laughing. In the pride <laughs> <laughs> laughter, right? When she when Mia said something like, Oh yeah, let's put her in a bathtub with a guy and see what happens, you know. And, and said, no, let's make him a stripper. No, and at first he has a strip tease, then he goes into the bathtub, and we would just die laughing about all that. So the funny part was great. I would <laughs> oh I'm not actually I'm crying laughing now just thinking about it. <laughs> so. I know. That's and then great. like, you know, just the granny and all the different the different like not even the the main characters, but some of the the silly ones. And you know, we everybody has a name of a plant, and so just coming up with the names for people, giving them a name like moss or if fern and and but it was it, it was just so fun to try to find the right it was name hard. For yeah, it was hard. Plan for it was hard. Hard. <laughs> to come up with a plant a bush a, you know a flower for everybody's name the women were easy it's the guys that were hard yeah and right we right. had to expand it to bushes and, and trees and that helped <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and foreign things languages are- a, a large plant kingdom to help out. <laughs> and foreign languages too. They had to come up. We have a lot of it's a lot of Latino characters and a lot of ensemble Latino characters in there that had to have names that made sense in Spanish. So yeah. yeah, that was great. Let's take a short pause and we'll be right back. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook. Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70%. They actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out or at least shrink the middleman. Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. Pro Audio Voices hears you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, We've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% royalties of the price you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com in the marketing menu. And we're back. So you got the book written, and then you continued the journey into the audiobook production, co-narrating. Yeah. So tell us about that and sort of what you did to do the recording process. Well, we wouldn't have got into it had we not done it before. So Mia had done some audiobooks previously, and I had done a lot of voiceover in the past. Uh, and I lived in Europe, and not a lot, but enough to know, you know, uh, you know my way around. So we just, you know, right. decided to do it that way. And um, I have to, I have to thank Mia had the, the bulk of the share because she had 20 chapters. I only had eight as the dead girl. So she had the lion's share of all this and we got through it. 
a lot of tea and honey for me. <laughs> I think Mia had some aspirin on her side too. So <laughs> but we got through it and uh, we're done. Yeah. Yeah. I have um, a little bit of a reading thing that, that I knew about, but when I first started and I should have done this like a million years ago, because when I, why I stopped doing my own audiobooks was editing myself because I'd stop and start or, you know, I have a little bit of dyslexia, but anyways, after the first session, I, a friend of mine's sister, like helps people with that kind of stuff. So I figured out what my, what the issue was and that I had a leading left eye and she gave me all these exercises. So it started to help. So bless everybody's heart for their patience with it. But I think it turned out good. I think it turned out great. And yeah. it was actually really fun to do that. My worry was for anyone else, like having to edit. But yeah. I think that's the thing with editing. It is, it is pretty specific and pretty cruel. Yeah. It's a whole separate skill. Great yes. for people who are really skilled with post-production audio. I don't know. Yeah. You guys, obviously, Becca, you do that. So how many of your yes. authors narrate, would you say, on average, their own books or they hire how many okay. of our authors? I would say maybe 10 to 15 percent, maybe. Okay. Really? Yeah. I would think it would be more, but I'm not sure why. I don't know. I, I haven't it's... actually looked to see. That's just a sense of about how many it might be. Could be higher, but. Yeah, for us, it was a, a big money saving effort. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> It was also because it was our voices. It was just the cadence and anyway, so I yeah. think we... And you both right had developed those skills. So it gets trickier when you have somebody who's doing that for the first time. They don't have any, you know, they haven't developed those skills as a narrator. Uh, the editing, the post-production then becomes a much bigger deal and can sometimes end up costing more than if they just hired a professional who knows how to do it in the first place. I could have used maybe some, uh, I threw myself into it, but I could have used maybe some coaching before I went into it. But <laughs> I winged it. And, uh, and of course, I, we have a lot of uh, multinational characters in there, which I like to do accents. And I have to say that I think I got through it. And Mia did a great job is to doing her own variation of the accents and softening her voice and all that. So I think we got there in the end, you know, with our different interpretations yeah. of these characters. We have uh, Chinese, we have Asians, we have Latinos, we have everything under the sun. So, uh, you know, yeah. we, did, we hope we did everybody justice and we're not going to get canceled. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And were you working in home studios? No, we worked in, in a uh, boutique studio. And so now, of course, we would love to have you guys input on how we market and how we go forward. Yes. Yeah. Our, with your marvelous new program. So I know, Becky, I knew probably. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about distribution. So I talk about this often in other podcast episodes. So I'm not going to like dive into a whole how-to thing. But yeah, we've been talking with you about Amplify, our new, mm -hmm. the program itself is not actually new, but the upgrade that we're about to implement is huge. We're having an app developed specifically for that program and have modified it such that you're going to have so much control much higher royalties than you can get anywhere else. So it's really a direct, we're just creating a platform where authors can sell directly through Amplify. And we're so excited about it. We're also going to be doing a whole lot of marketing for, you know, as a part of that, this sort of relaunch, if you will, or upgrade. And I think that's going to have a lot of benefit for all the authors who are participating. So we're excited you're going to be with us. We're really looking forward to exploring Amplify with you guys, you know, both distribution and also the marketing. I think, you know, the, the audio book marketing is is probably different than, you know, when we sell our Kindle and our paperbacks. Uh, right. Different, different outlets, I guess. Right. There are different opportunities and expanded opportunities because really what you've created in your recording process is you've got this huge asset and that is different from a text asset that you have when you just when you write the book. So yeah, there's a lot of great opportunities there. And we're also rolling out, technically have rolled out, but we haven't made a big announcement on it yet, is the our marketing membership program, which we're going to be able to, you know, support our authors in, you know, just having some like a monthly call where you can 
get your questions answered, you know, in small group and, you know, cheer each other on, get new ideas, you know, get your- audio book shrink. Is that like like an audio book shrink where we can, we can talk about it? Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> sort of like that. <laughs> that's great, though. But that's right. great because it just builds on the community. That's one of the things that is so important to us in the thick of all of this now in terms of planning for the launch and and getting the the content, the messaging. That's the thing that keeps coming up again and again is really making it clear that what this is all about is supporting a community of actor of writers, authors, you know, because I feel like it's hard to have being an author be a sustainable living, right? I think there's a whole historical thing that I, on how we are in the place that we are right now, but we're trying to be at the leading edge of getting us into a better place so that writing great content actually pays off and you get get paid for this work that you've done. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're going to be the uh, the darling of the author's guild community because every day I get the feed Everybody's struggling yeah. with the marketing, even of their not only the audio books, but also the production of their audio books. There's constant back and forth as who, what, where, how, and what happens afterwards, and and complaints yeah. and, and and issues. So I think you're, you're doing a Thank great you. service, Becky. You guys on uh, providing yeah, service we're, to these authors. Given a, all we've got. Do you have any yeah, plans but, for a yeah. sequel or other books uh, that you're planning to co-author or? for now is this we're putting all our efforts now into Great. trying to get this on a screen so i have actually yeah. written um I, we call it episode 101 of the limited series probably could break into six maybe eight episodes depending upon uh this the um the outlet and so we've gotten actually as of today five producers interested in reading the script so that's great let's that's really on. great how can our listeners find out more about what's happening with you guys follow your progress and learn more what's your website well it's in the dead girl has its own website deadgirlbook.com my website's angelapage.net, and I'm angelapage1200, Great. Twitter and Instagram. So you can to you. Mia, did you want to chime in any? Deadgirl.book, so you can follow follow us there. Actually, my personal Instagram got hijacked, so I don't have that anymore. But you can find the book at deadgirl.book on Instagram. And then I'm at Mia Altieri on Twitter and Facebook. That's great. And of course, once uh, Amplify app launches, which should be by the end of this month. Uh, so let's sort of look for it in December. Maybe it'll be live sooner, but that will be another place to find your audiobook. Oh, great. So, well, Mia, Angela, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been really fun. Thank you, Becky, very much. Great. Thanks, Becky. It's terrific. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.